Welcome. Well, <laughs> tepid, tepid applause. Uh, good thing I am confident. Um, uh, how are you doing? How's your day? Saying hi to all of our people online. How you guys doing? Welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Um, we're so glad that you're joining us. Um, we have a, a host online, so if you're online, we want you to be a part of it in every way that you can, which is all of the ways, and so you can text in questions, or not text in questions, you can just put questions right in the chat on YouTube, and then they're going to forward them to me. Um, so welcome. Who, who, I'm curious, who here attends this church on a weekly basis? This is like your church that you attend every week. Okay, and who here attends a different church? A few people, cool, well that's great. I just didn't know and I was curious, so there was no purpose for that other than my own curiosity. Um, it's an egregious waste of all of your time. <laughs> well, if you don't know me, my name is Landon and I, I uh, wanted to talk to you guys about the book of Leviticus. We've been doing this for two weeks, I think. We did the book of Joel which was awesome. And now we're looking verse by verse through the book of Leviticus and we are seeing that what can appear as a tedious text can, uh, given uh, the right framework, be, I think, very exciting. And I hope you feel that way. If you're new, if it's your first week since we've been doing Leviticus, the basic way that I've given people to understand uh, the book is that it's more like a recipe book or uh, like an informational text and less like a narrative. It's not like Psalms, it's not like John. If you read it like that, you're gonna be disappointed. Um, but if you take it for what it is, like nobody would read a recipe book straight through and be like, oh my gosh, this is so boring. They would go to it, they would get the information they need and they would do a thing. And that's what the book of Leviticus was for. And so we don't read it like devotionally. We don't read like two verses of it and we're like, oh my gosh, Jesus loves me so much and then go to work. We don't do that because that's not what it's for. Now, Jesus does love you, of course, and the love of Jesus is in this book. It's just not in the same way. And so when we let uh, some of the biblical texts be what they are, it actually unlocks our ability, I think, personally, to enjoy them quite a bit more and see them for what they are. So we've gone through this, the first of seven sections uh, we have gone through. Um, tonight, we're gonna attempt to go through all of section uh, three, or uh, section two, rather, we'll see. Um, the structure of Leviticus is, is chiastic, and, and what that means is that it's a mirror of itself. It was written that way intentionally by Moses. Where it starts is where it finishes. Where it moves in the second uh, movement is also the second to last movement. The clean or unclean um, section of laws clearly mirror each other. And the Day of Atonement is one of the most iconic chapters in the Old Testament. And um, this guy, you know, is uh, potentially some of the characters we're going to read about today. This is one of the most hyper-intense um, passages in the Old Testament. And so if you, would, uh, if you were ever to encounter a person in your life who is an atheist or was a deconstructionist Christian or whatever, these are some of the chapters they may point to and be like, you know, the Bible's terrible or whatever. Or they go to the part in Judges. Um, is there children in here? No? Okay, I just always get nervous about that. That's how intense the Bible is. They have to be nervous about saying its contents plainly in front of children. Um, I always thought that was funny. All right. It is. It is. Like if the, if the book of Judges was a movie, are you telling me that wouldn't be rated R? If they did it any justice, it would be. All right, here we go. We're gonna look at, hopefully, Lord willing, chapters eight through 10. I know we've already prayed. Why don't we just pray and invite the Lord really quickly um, into this place? He's already here. Let's continue to invite him. God, we love you and we love uh, your, your word because you wrote it. Help us to see what is happening in this text clearly. And I pray and ask and believe by faith that the same Holy Spirit that wrote this text um, 3,400 years ago is here right now, the same exact spirit, and we can drink deeply of that spirit as we lean from your, learn from your word, and we're praying this now in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, let's go for it. Leviticus, I, I, I wrote down, is uh, about the priest's role in leading the people of Israel to approach God's glory and holiness. The key verse of the book is chapter 20, verse 26. 
you shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. And that's a repeated idea throughout the text that it's really important to keep in mind. I have separated you from the peoples. God didn't create the content of Leviticus out of nowhere and say, these are all of the things I want you to do and not do. He's reacting to some of the things that happened in the culture of Egypt and some of the things that are about to happen in the culture of Canaan. He's saying, don't be like that. And he's also being like a parent. Like I always said this example already, but just in case people are new, like yesterday my son was climbing on this table and I told him to get down and then he was climbing on it again. And then I put the kids outside um, because I'm a bad parent and I wanted to talk to my wife and not to them. Um, <laughs> and then I told them to stay outside. We have a big glass door so I can see all of them. I was like, stay outside for like 10 minutes. I just wanna talk to, I knew her before you guys. I just wanna talk to her, okay? Stop usurping her time and my time. I love you, we're doing our best. We're clearly not doing well. Like, with you, we're, we're trying. <laughs> And so we put them outside, and the rule was don't come back inside. But they kept coming back inside. So then I closed the door, and I said, don't open the door. And then they opened the door and came back inside. So then the new rule became don't touch the door. That was the rule I had to make with my parents. This is what's happening in the Old Testament. God doesn't want all of these rules. It isn't his heart to continually put rules on people. In fact, if you read straight through um, the Mosaic books, Genesis through Deuteronomy, you'll see that often when there is a very specific weird sin, they're very quickly after that, sometimes immediately, sometimes in the next section of law, is laws about that exact thing. And that's what you're gonna see here. You're gonna see a section about the failure of the priests, and then you're gonna see an extensive section on how to be a priest in a clean or unclean way and also a person. So I hope that that makes sense. Let's look, um, let's look here into uh, what we're reading, starting in chapter eight, where we left off last week. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him and the garments and the anointing oil and the bull of the sin offering and the two rams and the basket of unleavened bread and assemble all the congregations at the entrance of the tent of meeting. It sounds like the greatest picnic of all time. Verse uh, three, uh, sorry, verse four. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him. That's a motif in the Old Testament. God will say something and then it'll say, the person did what God commanded them. The whole narrative with Noah up until the ark is structured around that repeating motif. Noah did all that God commanded him. It's a really remarkable thing, especially considering how much modern day Christianity and even myself is trying to figure out how little we can do and still get called a Christian in, in certain uh, instances or examples. Verse five, and Moses said to the congregation, this is the thing that the Lord has commanded to be done. That sounds like something a Gen Z person would say, isn't it? Like when Gen Z does art, they don't say like, hey, I made this painting. They say, I did a thing. Do you guys not know that that's what they do? I'm getting some real glares from the audience on this one. I'll just move on. Verse six, and Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water Water, I'm sure you understand, is a biblical picture of purity. And it's a picture of purity in culture, too. It's not just in the Bible. Verse seven, he put the coat on him and tied the sash around his waist and clothed him with the robe and put the ephod on him and tied the skillfully woven band of the ephod around him, binding it to him with the band. Now, I wanted to come dressed in all of that, but the person on Etsy that we found that can do that was really expensive. We didn't have it in the budget. I thought, it was, I thought it was a really good use. I was like, cut the coffee, we gotta get the ephod, man. <laughs> People did not like that idea. They were probably right. Verse eight, and he placed the breast piece on him, and in the breast piece, he put the Urim and the Thummim. Um, first, back in verse seven, when it says fine linen, um, that is the outfit of the collective bride of Christ in Revelation chapter 19. And then here, the breast piece is uh, kind of like a jacket, the way we would think of that. Um, the way it's red kind of makes it seem like it's like a kind of like a superhero chest plate. And that's not really what it was. It would seem more to us to be like a jacket. And in the center, there is this thing called Urim and Thummim, um, 
Does anyone know what, the, what that is? No? Great. Then let's talk about it for, for a minute. Um, it's not referenced a ton of times in the Bible, but Urim and Thummim, those two words are transliterations and not translations. Do you know what that means? That means that um, they did not translate those two words into the English equivalent. They decided that there is no English equivalent. So letter by letter, they translated the letters into English letters. Does that make sense? And that's why it sounds so unique to us. Because we don't have words for these things. Because we don't have these things. The best way of expressing them is that it is a, it is a collection of two like coin dice kind of things. And... No joke, the priests would actually keep them like on their chest in like this kind of like really sick fanny pack that they had with all these gems on it. And if they really didn't know what the will of the Lord was, they would literally pray and roll them. We don't know 100% what they look like. I think that it was two two-sided pieces. So you would roll them and it would either be two yeses, which you would take as a yes from the Lord, or two no's as you would take a no from the Lord, or one of each, which would be a like, no response, confused. Not that God is confused, but that would be like the way that you would take it. And so this is a really interesting concept for a lot of Christians because we read about the narrative about Gideon in the book of Judges, and we wanna like test God, and we wanna say, you know, one person on one side of Phoenix is praying right now, God, if you're real, make it rain tomorrow. The other person on the other side is praying, God, if you're real, don't make it rain tomorrow. And they're both going to bed, presumably ready for heartache when there's a massive dust storm um, and it's neither of their prayer comes true. And it's not wrong to test God. It's wrong to flippantly test God. And that's what I think a lot of Christians do. They just like get confused if in one moment and they're like, God, do this thing and prove yourself. That has no basis in scripture. I do think testing, I do think you can test God if you want to, even though it says in Deuteronomy, do not put the Lord to the test. I do think there is a sense that you can read the story of Gideon and be like, if I really need to, I can do this. That, that being said, you know, those are kind of all of the things that come to mind when I'm teaching on the Urim and Thummim. So hopefully that that helps you. Um, verse nine, and he set the turban on his head and on the turban in front, he set the golden plates the holy crown as the Lord commanded Moses. This guy looks lit. This is like some weird kind of like dusty Kanye West style outfit. <laughs> like the kind of outfit that you'd see on like a, on a model and be like, that looks cool. I mean, I would look stupid in it, but like that's cool. So he's got this kind of head-to-toe white thing going on. He's got this white turban. He's got this big gold plate on the top. He's just looking fresh. Verse 10, then Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it and consecrated them. That probably took a long time. We talked about this last week. There's lots of different things in the, in the tabernacle, and they're all symbolic of things and useful in the present moment. And Moses took this oil. Oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit, and oil is a picture of... Uh, the incredible, unneeded, uh, not, not unneeded, undeserved blessing of God. And he anointed everything. He drenched everything in oil. Uh, verse 11, and he sprinkled some of it on the altar seven times. That's a biblical picture of completeness, as we saw last week that they did with the blood. And he anointed the altar and all its utensils in the basin, and it stands to consecrate them. To consecrate something is to set it apart, to to decide that it is holy. And um, Christians in America have almost unilaterally lost the idea of being consecrated. We have replaced the idea of true holiness with not subscribing to HBO. We have replaced the true biblical idea of actually being consecrated to God with wearing a tie to church. Um, that's not what the Bible's talking about. The idea of being consecrated is so wonderful. It means that there's a line of people that stretches around the whole world and God would pull you out of it and say, you are useful for this purpose, but you're not like them anymore. You don't think like them, you have the mind of Christ. You don't act like them, you have the Holy Spirit. You don't believe like them, you have Jesus Christ and the cross. You don't live like them, you have the writings of Paul. You don't hope like them, you have Jesus Christ's return. 
and you're just a different person. That's the idea of consecration. It's, one, it's a wonderful thing. And we see it here in the Old Testament, verse 12. And he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. Moses is saying, Aaron, you're not like everybody else anymore. And when the, the people of Israel finally got out of the wandering of the wilderness and they went to the promised land in the, in the book of Joshua, they divide up all the land and they give a piece of the land to everyone. But to the Levites, they don't give any land because God says, I am your portion. They don't get land, they get God. And, and, and Moses is saying to him, and God is saying to him, you are now different than everyone else, Aaron. Verse 13, and Moses brought Aaron's sons and clothed them with coats and tied sashes around their waists and bound caps on them as the Lord commanded Moses. This is a big show. He's showing all the people of Israel what it looks like to be set apart, to be holy. And religion has taken just the external of dressing the part and forgotten the, the internal, which, which, is, which is more important. Um, verse 14, then he brought the bull of the sin offering and Aaron and his sons laid their head, hands on the head of the bull of the sin offering and he killed it and Moses took the blood and with his finger put it on the horns of the altar around it and purified the altar and poured out the blood at the base of the altar and consecrated it to make atonement for it. So now we see that the words that have been repetitively introduced in the first seven chapters are now being used more plainly here. We've been taught repetitively what they mean by the author, and now he's just using them in plain speak the way that he would use them. Um, and he took all the fat that was on the entrails and the long lobe of the liver and the, uh, liver and the two kidneys with their fat, and Moses burned them on the altar. He did exactly what God commanded. It says at the end of verse 17, then he presented the ram of the burnt offering, and Aaron and his sons laid their head uh, hands on the head of the ram, and he killed it. Moses threw the blood against the sides of the altar, and we see it exactly like it was written. And we see there at the end of verse 21, a pleasing aroma, a food offering for the Lord, as the Lord commanded Moses. We've moved out of the section of law into the section of narrative, and we're seeing the things that God commanded taking place in real time exactly the way that God asked for them to be done. Verse 22, then he presented the other ram, the ram of ordination. And Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the ram and he killed it. And Moses took some of its blood and put it on Aaron's right ear and, and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. They never explain what that picture means Maybe it was personal between them and God. I, I see it as blood on the ear, listen to God, blood on the thumb, walk, uh, work for God, and, and blood on the toe, um, walk with God. Verse 24, then he presented Aaron's sons and Moses put some of the blood on the lobes of their, their right ears and on the thumbs of their right hands and on the big toes of their right feet. He does it for both of Aaron's sons. Keep them in mind because they're the big center of this uh, part of the narrative. And Moses threw the blood against the sides of the altar and he took the fat and the fat tail and all the fat that was on the entrails and, and he did it all. He did it all right. And out of the basket of unleavened bread that was before the Lord, he took one unleavened loaf and one loaf of bread with oil and one wafer and placed them on the pieces of fat and on the right thigh. 27, and he put all of these in the hands of Aaron and in the hands of his sons and waved them as a wave offering before the Lord. Then Moses took them from their hands and burned them on the altar with the burnt offering. This was an ordination offering with a pleasing aroma, a food offering before the Lord. Moses took the breast and waved it for a wave offering before the Lord. It was Moses' portion of the ram of ordination as the Lord commanded him. It's Moses, Moses fed himself from this offering. Verse 30, then Moses took some of the anointing oil and, and of the blood that was on the altar and sprinkled it on Aaron and his garments and also on his sons and his son's garments. Keep that in mind. He keeps repeating what he's doing with his sons. So he consecrated Aaron and his garments and his sons and his son's garments with him. Consecration is the key word in this chapter. Verse 31, and Moses said to Aaron and his sons, boil the flesh at the, at the entrance of the tent of meeting and there eat it and the bread that is in the basket of ordination offerings as I commanded saying, Aaron and his sons shall eat it. We're seeing a repetitive theme here. 
It's prepping us for what's happening later. And he's saying and showing that God is consecrating Aaron and his sons to be holy. Keep that in mind because it's been in the text about seven times now. And Moses really wanted us to see the level at which God was showing Aaron and his sons how to behave and how to live. Um, Verse 33, you shouldn't go outside the entrance of the tent of meeting for seven days until the days of your ordination are completed, for it will take seven days to ordain you. As has been done today, the Lord has commanded me to make atonement for you. So Moses is saying, I know this this ordination offering wasn't in the first seven chapters. I'm doing it because God told me, which is the best way as a Christian to get out of something if you don't want to do it. But in Moses' case, it works really well because it happens to be true. Verse 35, at the entrance of the tent of meeting, you shall remain day and night for seven days, performing what the Lord has charged, so that you do not die. You should underline that verse. At the entrance of the tent of meeting, you shall remain day and night for seven days, performing what the Lord has charged. Aaron, sons, do this for a week. Don't do anything else because you will die, because it's serious. It's life and death serious. And Aaron and his sons did all the things that the Lord commanded uh, by Moses. So they got kind of quarantined in there in the tabernacle for about seven days. Um, Which we got got more bits on quarantine coming up here, I think, in chapter 11. I read them a lot differently now than I did before COVID. Uh, I used to think, oh, that sounds fun. That's cool. So you don't have have to go to work or anything. You just get to hang out. I was like, oh, that sounds fun. Uh, And then I got quarantined with my kids. Chapter 9, on the eighth day, Moses called Aaron and his sons and elders uh, and the elders of Israel. He said to Aaron, take for yourself a bull calf for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering, both without blemish, and offer them before the Lord. Say to the people of Israel, take a male goat for a sin offering and a calf and a lamb, both a year old without blemish, for a burnt offering. So we don't have time to go through this chapter verse by verse and get through the rest of everything we're going. So basically, it's an additional... um, Uh, Offering, It's an additional command. I'll show you some of the specific things that we should look at. Verse 8. So Aaron drew near to the altar and killed the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. Verse 9. And the sons of Aaron presented the blood to him, and he dipped his finger in the blood and put it on the horns of the altar and poured out the blood at the base of the altar. So far, so good. Verse 12. Then he killed the burnt offering, and Aaron's sons handed him the blood. Now, how do you hand somebody a liquid? Just pointing it out. Don't know how you do it. Verse 15, then he presented the people's offerings and he took the goat of the sin offering. Verse 21, uh, but the breast and the right thigh Aaron waved for a wave offering before the Lord as Moses commanded. So it's doing a repeat showing you that he did exactly as the Lord commanded, as Moses was commanded. Verse 22, then Aaron lifted his hands towards the people and blessed them, and and he came down from offering the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings. Um, um, He, 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 can you picture it? He came came down from inside the, the tent to the people, and he lifted up his bloody hands and prayed for the people. That's, that's a sight, isn't it? That's not something people would, would forget. Their, their pastor, their leader, holding up his bloody hands, uh, praying for them. Verse 23, and Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting, and when they came out, they blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. This was the whole point. This is where God was trying to get them to. It's the same exact thing that happens in Exodus. This was the point of the Garden of Eden, to create a space that people could live with the glory of God. And then Adam and Eve wrecked it because of the stupid devil. And then God is trying to get people back to this place of Eden. He's trying to get people back to this place where he can live with his glory with them. But people just keep getting more and more and more sinful. So he destroys all the people and saves Moses and, or uh, Noah, and then Noah, you know, gets tanked and lays down in a vineyard, and God's like, oh, gosh. Like, and then the, he keeps trying to make it happen, and now the tabernacle is his latest effort 
in making this happen. In Exodus, God said, I want all of you to walk up the mountain and I will show you my glory. And they wouldn't do it because they were afraid of him. And now he's saying, okay, well, if you won't do that, then I'll build this tabernacle and I'll make sure everybody's clean because I cannot come near sin because I am holy. So I'm gonna make sure everybody's clean and I'm gonna set this up in the right way. And they do it like for like only four times in the whole Old Testament do they ever like actually succeed. Um, and, and this is one of them. Uh, before they fail epically in the next chapter. And, and they do it, and God's glory comes down, and that was the whole point. The whole point was to be able to be close to God. Um, 24, and fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering. I think the only way that I can read that is that fire came straight out of the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle onto the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Man, it's always made me sad when, when people say that when they get to heaven, they're gonna tell, tell God a few things, huh? I didn't even mean that as a joke. It makes me sad. Because you won't. Because every single person in the whole Bible who encountered God fell on their face. How about some questions? And then we'll look through chapter 10. I wrote down, like at the end of Exodus, this is God's stamp of approval, which is juxtaposed with chapter 10, which is God's stamp of judgment. Um, so we see those two, two ideas juxtaposed. Who has a question? Um, we can have a question from, uh, from the internets. And we can also have a question uh, on, in person. Let me see if I got any. Uh, here we go. From Linda on Facebook, that's my grandma's name, as related to the penalty for disobedience in chapter 10, how does that relate to us today for disobedience? Linda, you're too smart because we haven't got to chapter 10 yet. Uh, well done. The, the, how does it relate? We'll get there. Um, we'll get there when we get there in, in a few moments when we're finished with all the questions. Does anyone have a question in the room? Runners are just poised. They are, they are gonna, they're gonna sprint to you. Got another one from Facebook. From Kelly on Facebook. The Urim and the Thummim are elements of the ephod of the Hoshin the breastplate worn by the high priest attached to the ephod. They are connected with divination in general and cleromancy in general. Most scholars suspect that the phrase refers to a set of two objects used by the high priest to answer a question or reveal the will of God. Well, that is not a question. Um, but you said in it that they are connected with divination and that is not true. It is true that people could have used them like that, but that is not true. Um, so, you know, I say that as, as gently as I can. That's, that's just not correct. That's not what the text says. Um, and and uh, I love you. Do we have one out here? You know, my question actually um, was about the same thing you just spoke on, uh, because I thought like the divination, like casting lots and stuff like that, it, it's kind of like hokey pokey and you're not really supposed to be doing that stuff. So when I, when I see that, or like even, I think it's Zachariah and Luke, they talk about, you know, casting. Just having a bit of trouble hearing you. I'm sorry. Could you just oh, hold it a bit closer? Yep, sorry about that. Um, so, you know, when we hear about, the, you know, whether two coin things or casting lots with, you know, in Luke with Zachariah and things like that, um, you know, I've always thought of it as the divination. You really shouldn't be playing around with that because, you know, that's just what I've always kind of understood. Sure. So... Yeah, I, it, they certainly can be used that way. Um, God designed the outfit, and so God wouldn't design the outfit containing things that were inherently used for wrongdoing. You could use them for wrong in the same way that we can use a lot of things that God created for good for wrong, sex, money, you know, whatever. And so that, that's really the way that I see it. I, I, think, it was a, I think it was a last ditch thing. I don't think it was a primary usage, and I don't think uh, testing God is a primary usage today. Um, I think that the primary way to discern God's will is, number one, to recognize that most of the things that we're concerned about, um, God is not concerned about. 
Um, and God, God is concerned about the, and I'm not even answering your question anymore, but I just hope that it helps and blesses people. Thank you for your question. And, and um, God is concerned about the type of person that we are and our internal life as we become like Jesus Christ. And um, when people uh, ask you to pray, you know, what car they should buy as a stereotypical joke or maybe something more intense that even still, like what college should I go to? What job should I take? Often, uh, I don't think God gives an answer because God doesn't have an answer. God is like, well, what, what type of person are you gonna be at those places? Am I not gonna be at both of those places? And I, then I do think that God will lead us away from the wrong decisions, but that, I hope that that helps. I know that a lot of people think that, that way and ask that, so. Thank you. Yeah. Does anyone else have a question in the room? Somebody back there? Hi, I don't know if I'm a little confused if the consecration is just for the priests or is it for everybody? The consecration is just for the priests in this ceremony. God does want everyone to be holy, but, but everyone's not the same. So we're, we're equal, but we're, we're not the same. And so he does want us all to be holy, but he is consecrating them in a, in a very unique way um, that he has not for anyone else. Okay, because I know, like in Catholicism, the nuns and the priests ha have to remain pure and they can't be married. But in like Christianity, that's different. So, did For that change is. with <laughs> did that change with the New Testament, or at what point does that change? Yeah, with Catholicism and with the nuns and the priests not getting married, that is uh, a decision of the Church. And those things have only been practiced since Jesus was here because there was no Catholicism before that um, because it, it just couldn't have existed because it's, it's a, a, a tangent of, of Christianity. Um, it's probably why I didn't become a priest, honestly. You know, um, just couldn't have made it work. My wife's too pretty. Um, I would have been like, dang it. Um, and then I would have called a Protestant church and be like, can we trade? You got any single pastors you want to trade? Um, so that's that. Um, that is not a, that's not a, a, a mechanism of the, of the Old Testament in anything that I've studied or, or looked at, and, and I hope that that helps, but I think that's a really good question. Um, I do wonder if we'll see that change in Catholicism in our lifetime. Um, it's just a thought. I think we have one over here in the center aisle. Hi, yes. Hi. So I have just a very general question mm -hmm. um, for the sacrifices that weren't either burnt or God burned it himself. What mm -hmm. would happen to the meat? Mm -hmm. Did the animals just get it or did they leave it to rot? So um, the, 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 the burnt offering was burnt completely until it was gone. And then there was a grain offering that was actually given to the priests um, and they were allowed to take it and eat it. And it's really cool when you read that part, which we talked about two weeks ago, which is that um, they would salt the bread to make sure that it was good for the priests to have, which is, which is awesome. And then for the fellowship offering, it was actually designed, although the text isn't super clear on it, it was actually designed for the people to eat together, potentially with the priests or with each other. So there was a way for all of it to be used. Um, they weren't wasting it. It was very, very valuable to them. And that's what makes the burnt offering so intense because no one got it except God. Okay. Hope that helps. Anybody else? Are we ready for chapter 10? It's the tough one. You ready? Okay, because there's no going back. Once I start... Do you have, we have 24 minutes. Do you have 24 minutes of questions? Okay. Here we go. Are you sure? Okay. Chapter 10. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it, 
and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. There's been a lot of study on this verse uh, because specifically of the word unauthorized there, which is a bit difficult to translate. What we know happened is God asked Aaron and his sons something very specific and very clear. And we know that now, mere couple days after that, they are intentionally doing something that is totally different than that. They are taking a censer, which is a handheld item that could potentially contain incense, and they are putting fire in it and laying incense on it and offering unauthorized fire. Now, the most important phrase in this verse is the next phrase, after unauthorized fire. Do you see what that says in your Bible? What, somebody tell me, somebody online tell me, what does it say? Before the Lord. Now, the phrase before the Lord in Leviticus means something very specific. To us, we're so accustomed to the blessing of the presence of the Lord everywhere. I feel the presence of the Lord all the time. I hope you do. And it doesn't have anything to do with me. It's just a blessing. I feel the presence of the Lord while I'm driving. I feel the presence of the Lord while I'm hanging out and playing Nintendo with my son. I feel the presence of the Lord all the time. It's just a blessing. This is different. Um, this is something totally different. I would think that I can go before the Lord anywhere, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you feel comfortable saying anywhere that you would pray that you are about to go before the Lord? That's not the case here. The phrase before the Lord in the book of Leviticus means going into the Holy of Holies, uh, which is a no-go. Um, it's a no-go. It's an absolute no. In fact, by the time all of this stuff was finished, only one priest was allowed to go in the Holy of Holies once per year. And it was so intense that they would tie a rope around that priest's ankle so that if he was too sinful and he died in there, they wouldn't have to walk in and get his corpse. They would drag his body out. So these people understood what was happening. They had just seen fire come out of the Holy of Holies. They had seen the glory of the Lord. They had seen God descend on Mount Sinai. They had seen and heard the trumpet sounds in Exodus 18. They had heard the voice of the Lord coming from Mount Sinai that it says was so terrifying that the people of Israel begged Moses to ask him to stop speaking. So these people are not unaware of the type of God that they are interacting with. And Aaron's sons were the exact opposite of what they were supposed to be. Instead of doing things correctly, instead of being patient, they were like, oh, cool, God came down in a cloud. We don't need to do this stuff anymore. And they put some weird incense in a little holder and just ran into the Holy of Holies. I do think if they would have stayed in the outer court, God would have let them live. But he did not. I wrote down most of, if not all of the commands in the law are directly written to something that happened before or after in the narrative. I've talked about that today. From piecing together the law and the rules that came after this, specifically chapter 10 verse 9 and chapter 16, well, we're going to get there because there's more to the story that gets filled in in a second. Verse 2, and fire came out from where? Before the Lord. That's exactly where the fire came out before. The fire came out to celebrate obedience and the fire came out to punish disobedience and it consumed them and they died before the Lord. They died inside the Holy of Holies, one of the rarest places in the whole world. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord has said, among those who are near me, I will be sanctified and before all the people, I will be glorified. This is what the Lord has said, Aaron. Among those people who come near me, I will be sanctified. And before all the people, I will be glorified. I wish that I could, could explain that. Verse four. And Moses called Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said to him, come near, carry your brothers away from the front of the sanctuary and out of the camp. So it's unclear if they were dragged out of the Holy of Holies and, 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 and laid inside the tent, or if they were still dying when they ran out. It's, it's not really clear. 
I would assume that their bodies were pulled out. Verse five, so they came near and carried them in their coats out of the camp, as Moses had said. They're carrying their cousins in a coat. And Moses said to Aaron and to Eleazar and to Ithamar, his sons, don't let the hair of your heads hang loose. Don't tear your clothes lest you die. And the wrath come upon all the congregation. But let your brothers and the whole house of Israel bewail the burning that the Lord has kindled. Which I think is important. Because we don't have to celebrate every single thing that, that God does. We can mourn things that God does. We don't have to celebrate as Christians when God judges someone righteously. We can look at it and be like, that was righteous, and that was right, but man, that's tough, and that's okay. Verse seven, don't go outside of the entrance of the tent of meeting lest you die. He was supposed to be in his uh, quarantine period. For the anointing oil of the Lord is on you, and they did according to the word of Moses. And the Lord spoke to Aaron saying, drink no wine or strong drink, you or your sons with you when you go into the tent of meeting lest you die. Now, why do you think he said that? It's now, it's now really like the big alcohol time right after your sons pass. No, he's saying it because that's what they did. To me, it's, it's super clear. You don't see a ton of specific commands like that unless it was something that just happened. And then you see the secondary part of the passage, which, or the verse which says what? Let this be a statute. What does it say? I lost it. Thank you. Yes, verse nine. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. You know, don't show up drunk to the priesthood and do something the opposite of what I told you to and run into the presence of God. Don't do that. Also, in that moment, the presence of God was uniquely in the Holy of Holies based on chapter 9 in a way that it hadn't been before. Verse 10. You are to distinguish between the holy and the common, between the unclean and the clean, and you are to teach the people of Israel all the statutes that the Lord has spoken to them by Moses. Aaron, you're supposed to teach people the difference between the holy and the common. So, showing up drunk to work, what is that? Is that holy or is that common? This is what, this is what God is saying to him. And it's tough. Not because that specific thing is tough. I don't think it's tough at all, but because of what happened to him and to his family. Verse 12, Moses spoke to Aaron and, and Eleazar and Ithamar, his surviving sons. Take the grain offering that is left for the Lord's food offerings and eat it unleavened beside the altar for it's most holy. You shall eat it in a holy place because it's your due and your son's due from the Lord's food offerings for so I am commanded. But the breast that is waved and the, thing, the thigh that is contributed, you shall eat in a clean place. You and your sons and your daughters with you for they are given as your due and your sons due from the sacrifices of the peace offerings of the people of Israel. This thigh that is contributed and the breast that is waved they shall bring with the food offerings of the fat pieces to wave for a wave offering before the Lord. And it shall be yours and your sons with you as a due offering or as a due forever as the Lord has commanded. Now Moses diligently inquired about the goat of the sin offering and behold, it was burned up. And so Moses was angry with Eleazar and Ithamar. This is the, the other two sons of, of Aaron saying, why have you not eaten the sin offering in the place of the sanctuary since it is a most holy thing and has been given to you that you may be bear the iniquity of the congregation to make atonement for them before the Lord? Verse 18, behold, its blood was not brought into the inner part of the sanctuary. Moses is like, you guys, it's been a tough day. Moses was worried that they were going to get struck down too. And he's like, you're not doing it right. You certainly ought to have eaten it in the sanctuary as I commanded. Verse 19, Aaron said to Moses, behold, today they've offered their sin offering and their burnt offering before the Lord. And yet such things as these have happened to me. If I had eaten the sin offering today, would the Lord have approved? And when Moses heard that, he approved. 
I wrote down, Aaron's sons refused to obey and they refused to be sanctified. It wasn't God being incredibly nitpicky. You see Aaron change something later in the chapter and nothing happens. Aaron's sons were brazen and they disobeyed significantly and horribly. And um, we actually come back to that idea again in chapter 16. Um, and this is the thing about this book that's so tough. It's, t- it's a tough passage. Um, it's, it's tough because it doesn't really uh, make total sense to our modern sensibility. It's tough because Jesus is amazing and has completely upended our understanding of our relationship with God because he has made peace between us and God. And so the relationship between God and Aaron and the relationship between God and Nadab and Abihu, we have never experienced except in reading it. We don't know what that feels like. We don't know what that looks like. We don't know what that is like. I know what it's like to sin. I know what it's like to screw up. I know what it's like to trip up, slip up, fail, falter. Do you? And I know what it's like when I go to God. And I know what it's like to receive God's forgiveness again. And I know the grace that pours down from God. And so reading this makes me thankful for Jesus because this isn't what God wanted. God didn't want a tabernacle. He wanted everybody in Eden. God didn't want two drunken guys running into his holiness, infecting him with sin. And he is incapable of that in a way that we will never understand. I don't even think God had a choice. I think that God is so holy that if sin comes that close to him, he will immediately act out of protection for the most valuable thing in the universe, which is his holiness. Remember the part where God turned away from the earth, the moment when Jesus was was dying. The only time in all of the Bible that God is incapable of looking at the earth, or at least unwilling, when all of the sin was on his son. And God is making it so, and has made it, so that things don't have to be like this anymore. And so that's um, the priest section from chapters eight through 10. Um, We can take some questions. We have a few minutes left to take some questions. Um, And then next week we're gonna be heading into clean or unclean, which um, some some good joke material in those chapters for sure. Gonna have to be careful next week. Does anyone have any questions? So thankful you guys would come. Rod, if there's any more questions on Facebook or or there, you could send them to me, that'd be great. And does anyone in the room have any questions? Anybody? Got one here in the front. Hello. Hi. On, uh, where'd it go? Sorry. Uh, It's all good. So verse number six, it says, Then Moses said to Aaron and his sons, Do not let your hair become unkempt, and do not tear your clothes, or you will die. Why weren't they? That, to me, that's like a sign of mourning. Mm-hmm. Why weren't they allowed to mourn? Those were his sons. Um, they were allowed to mourn, because you see in the second part of the chapter that they did mourn in their own way. Um, it's during the um, um, ordination, and they have a job to finish. And the way I take it is that Moses is saying to them, like, it could continue. Like, do your job, it could continue, and he doesn't know what's going to happen. That's the way I read it. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? There's one back there. Hi. Hi. Hi, Um, I have a question on verse 17. Okay. So here it says, why have you not eaten the sin offering in a holy place since it is most holy and God has given it to you? 
to bear the guilt of the congregation, to make atonement for them before the Lord. Um, I'm just trying to understand the association, sort of preparing for, for Jesus coming. Um, can you expound on that? Maybe if you said one or two more sentences of what you're thinking, it would help me understand a little bit better. So it seems to me that he is, in a way, um, setting the table in preparation for the Lord's return and the sacrifice that's coming forth. Um, and I just wanted to see if there's anything that you could add to maybe that whole um, event that's going to happen in the New Testament. Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I can just read you what it says in Hebrews chapter 10, um, which is better than what I would say, which is, for since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers having once been cleansed would no longer have any consciousness of sins? But in these sacrifices, there's a reminder of sins every year. It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you haven't desired, but a body have you prepared for me in burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in offerings and, 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 uh, and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And here's the best part. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And every priest stands daily at his surface, offering routinely, repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting for that time until his enemies should be made a footstool under his feet. Last verse. For by a single offering, he has perf perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And so I think that underlines, I hope that answers your question. It's assuredly more poetic than I would have been able to say it. And I think that that shows what I've been trying to hit at a few times, which is that this was not God's intention. He, he even says in the New Testament, like, I don't even like this stuff. Whether he's saying I don't like it anymore or I never did, I don't know. But he's saying that wasn't the point. The point was to draw your attention to this amazing thing that has happened. So I hope, I hope that helps. Did it? Yes. yes, thank you. Good. It's uh, the first half of Romans chapter 10. kind of a good Jesus juke when someone asks a question. If you don't really know the answer, just read a scripture passage that pertains to it. What are they going to say? That's a joke. Anybody else got any questions? Cool. All right, let me pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for these wonderful people. Thank you for what it says about them, that they're here and that they're online. Thank you for uh, the leaning in that I feel from these people. Thank you that we are united in spirit. Thank you that we are united in the death of Christ that has freed us from the things that we read about in these chapters. And it just feels so tedious, God. And I'm not ashamed to say that because you just said in Hebrews chapter nine that it's not your favorite thing either. And I just love that. I love that you're so much more complicated and unique and artistic than we often give you credit for. We love you, God. We're so thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ that has cleansed us from sin, has, uh, has and is continuing to sanctify us, and is turning us into uh, a mirror image of Jesus Christ as we, we are, like it says in Corinthians, sanctified from one degree of glory to another. And so we take joy in studying your word, even if it's a bit confusing and, and tough and dense, because we love you, and we love the, the work of art that you've put out into the world, the Bible, and we want to study it and know it, not out of our own effort, not to, to please somebody or to 
make ourselves sound awesome, but because if you wrote it, then we'll read it. And if you wrote it, then we'll study it and learn it because we love you, God. And so we thank you now in Jesus' name, amen.